Hello, I'm in Bladen today and I'm starting a series of walks which I've been planning for some time and each of these walks has one common feature at some point it will involve a piece of history from the Jacobites now the walks aren't necessarily just about the Jacobites it's although I'll try and put as much history as I can into the walks uh, but the common factor within each walk is that there will be a piece concerning the 1715 uprising in Northumberland. So I was beginning the walk in Bladen because it's basically it's the closest walk to where I live and this here is actually the start of the lead road walk which I did uh, last year. Apparently I should have started from this point um, because here let me show you, are the blade and staves. This is where the lead was uh, put on the boats and then shipped wherever it needed to be. Now this place here, I'm not exactly sure what it is now, uh, but this used to be uh, a windmill in um, 1780, I think, thereabouts. And then this is the River Tyne. We'll have a closer look at this. But over there, in the, in the middle of the Tyne, used to be Bladen Island. And that's where the Bladen races were used to be held. Well, that was a bit of a disaster start. Just started off, and I was filming these steps down here because there's a uh, ruins of an old boat there as well. I slipped on the steps, slid all the way down into the mud, and covered in absolute mud, and broke the microphone on my camera. Bloody brilliant. Uh, luckily I carry a spare microphone in any case so I've just had to switch over the microphone and get rid of the mud as much as I can. Unfortunately it's not wholesome mud, it's the mud at the bottom of the time. I'm going to be stinking by the time I get home. But uh, never mind, sorted now, let's get it going. It was on this stretch of time that Bladen Island once existed and it was on Bladen Island that hosted the Blade and Racers. Obviously no island exists today. This here is where Blade and Burn joins the River Tyne. And my walk takes me up Blade and Burn, so that's where we're going now. I really hurt my uh, wrist on that fall, I've got a light sprain. Uh, where I'm stood now is the site of uh, Cowan's Lower Yard Fire Brick Factory. It was uh, opened in 1838 and at its height it made six million fire bricks a year. It closed in 1975. There's not a great deal left now. Over there, where those workmen are, they're busy doing some restoration work to the back end of the kilns. This here is the site of Massey's Forge, or Macy's Forge. It was originally built in the 18th century as a water-powered corn mill, but was later converted 
in the 19th century to a forge. We've got some uh, the building work here, which would be the forge. It was an overshot wheel, which wouldn't have been where the waterfall is now. The wheel would have been, I can't show you. The wheel would have been in here. The water would have come off there into the into this groove bit here is where the wheel would have stood. Now of course it's a quite impressive waterfall. Let's see if we can get a bit closer without falling in. I'm very aware that I'm not wearing boots today, which is probably why I slipped earlier on. There we go. This is the blade and bend, obviously. Once the mill had been converted into a forge, the water wheel would have been used to have uh, powered hammers, basically, to hammer the, the iron or the lead or whatever it was that they were busy forging at the time. This part of the walk, I'm busy following the Blade and Burn Wildlife and History Trail. I'll put a link below where you can get further details of that trail, but eventually I'll be leaving the trail and doing my own stuff. This path I'm busy walking on is the Blade and Burn Wagonway. It was built in 1840 to link Cowan's high yard pits and mills with the lower yard and the Newcastle Carlisle Railway. Above me is the very busy A695. I know the principles of bridge building and uh, having the gaps for expansion, but still quite disconcerting when you see a gap right through the middle of the bridge. <laughs> Just past the uh, A695 bridge, this is over a nice little weir. The history of Bladen Burn is dominated by the Cowans, particularly two Cowans, Joseph Cowan Sr. and Joseph Cowan Jr., his son. They were both liberal politicians for Newcastle and they were both quite radical in fighting for democratic reforms such as the secret ballot. Joseph Cowan Jr. fought for free education and the rights of minors. He was friends with Garibaldi and he was also friends with Karl Marx. So it was quite a radical. Of the remains of a dam here, no doubt it would have provided power further downstream. Perhaps connected to that weir that I saw before. So I'll get a closer look without falling in. Okay, I've got some really interesting structure here. I have no idea what it is. Try and guess it maybe. On the other side of those trees there's a stone wall and then down in the stream you've got these pillars. There's another one just over there. And I've got some more stone wall just here. And then if you come over here you've got a even more interesting stuff. We've got a, a run down here, some sort of water race down there, and the blade and bend disappears in a tunnel under there. Okay, I've come up to the top of the race. comes down there and it continues along here. I 
At some point there was a, a lock here, some sort of dam, and it continues over there. I've got a feeling it's all connected to a mill that's a bit further up. So we'll continue up and see if I'm right. Yes, I was right. This was the, the water race for um, Hobby's Mill. It was dammed further upstream and the water would have been channeled through this race. And it continues down to there where the wheel would have been, where we looked before those stone structures and those pillars. That would have been where the mill was. And it was a 18th century corn mill. I'm on top of the dam wall here. This all would have been a big pond once upon a time. And it would have provided water to power Hobby's mill, which we just saw before, followed the water trace before. Turn it on to me. It would have uh, been built in the 18th century, uh, 70, after 1713 apparently and uh, it was named after the miller who, uh, who had the mill, so Hobby was his name. In uh, 1914 the reservoir was used by Priestman Collieries to supply water to the workers. This here is the entrance to Edward Pitt. It was a coal mine from 1850 to 1896. And then from 1900, it was used as a tunnel to connect some tar works that were further up the valley uh, to the railway that used to run by here. And that's all bricked up and vandalized. Looks like someone's been trying to get in. I think they're gonna have a hard job getting in. It looks really thick, the, the, the cap on it. Quite an impressive entrance for a coal mine. I should say, an impressive entrance for a 19th century coal mine. The official trail heads up there and it goes around the back of what's supposed to be a meadow. But I'll give up a miss if I was you. It, uh, it goes up along the side of a, a landfill site and the stench is pretty bad up there like. So I will just continue along the, the old railway track. Much more pleasant. And then just double back on yourself when you get to the end. Yeah, you can see a bit of the old rail track that used to run along here. It's a very pleasant place. You won't expect somewhere like this in Bledon. It's worth checking out if you live local. Behind me once stood Wintrip's Mill, also known as High Mill. It was an 18th century water-powered flint mill. In those days, flint was used as a ballast in ships, and later on it was used in the glass and pottery industries on the Tyne. It was renamed Wintrip after a 19th century miller that ran the mill. Nothing remains of it now, because by 1914 it had been pulled down and replaced with coke ovens, and even the coke ovens are being reclaimed by nature. On this side was the coke platform, and there are some remains over here amongst these trees, so I'll go for a bit of a closer look. This is all that's left of the remains of the coke platform. It almost looks like another drift mine, but it's not. It's amazing how fast nature reclaims a site. This large structure here is the coal drop for Bessie's pit. 
coal wagons would have come up the top on a wagon way and then the coal would have dropped into more substantial carriages on the proper train line that ran down there. It's quite a substantial structure. There's a nice little stair well here. I'm not going up it. I'll slip on the backside again. The last time I came here I thought I had overshot the mine because the picture on the guide looks absolutely nothing like what remains there today. However, behind me is the entrance to Bessie's Drift Mine. That's all that remains of the entrance, all blocked up. Now it was opened in 2013 and there are some photographs on line uh, showing you inside the mine. So I'll put a link to those photos if anybody's interested. But it was quite some structure. Uh, the thing that threw me, other than the picture on the, on the trail guide, was down here, you have another coal chute. Mirrors the ones on the other side. And I just couldn't picture it in my head on how this site actually worked. So it completely threw me as to where the entrance to the mine was. But that grate over there, that, that was the entrance to the mine. Now I believe the mine was started in the 1850s or possibly 1860s. And it closed sometime around about 1953. If you come on this trail and you're looking for the entrance to Bessie's mine, there's the, the track. You go up these little steps here and then follow it along and the mine's just up there amongst those trees. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's a little bit difficult to find. But once you know where it is, it's really easy to find. <laughs> Typical, isn't it? This here is where the trail double backs on itself. Ideally, you should have come down this path here from the nature reserve and then down past the mines. Obviously, I didn't want to do the nature reserve. It didn't interest me. But uh, I am going beyond the end of the trail, further up the track because there's one more place of interest to show you, or two more places of interest actually. As you get closer to the end of the trail, you begin to see the remains of multiple lines where the tracks split off into different tracks. And it's all connected with just what's around the corner here. And once the trees here, you can see the remains of a lot of buildings and we're at the end of the line here so this is where the line actually finished and these buildings that you can see the remains of still get a bit closer to them This was a loading depot. That's what these buildings were the remains of. But what were they loading if the mines were further down? Well, that answer is across the road. Here was a much more substantial brickworks, clay and brickworks belonging to the Cowans. And it was here that most of the bricks were made and then they would have gone 
further down and loaded onto the trains at the end of the tracks. However, there was also a small wagonway here that connected to a pit or somewhere over there called Mary's Pit. And that pit actually produced more coal and employed more miners than Bessie Pit. So that concludes the blade and burn part of this walk and now I'm going to double back on myself and we're going to visit a working water mill and then we'll start talking about the Jacobites. Okay I'm at Pathhead water mill and I'm doing the tour this time. It was built in 1730 and it was a corn mill for flour. You see the, the mill race comes on there. It's only really used when you're using the mill, otherwise it's blocked off over there, you see, and then the water's diverted this way. Now this is the Acom water wheel and crankshaft was rescued from a mill in Acom. This part of the path is made with bricks from the brickworks. That's the Cowan name stamped on them. They're not all from the Cowan, there's, uh, there's one there, that's a beaut. But most of them are from the Cowan brickworks. I've got a wind pump. And there's a map of the United Kingdom in grass. Now this here's the reservoir. It provides the water for the mill till race. And we'll turn the, turn the mill further down. You need to come to places like this to learn the proper terminology. <laughs> but I was saying water race before. What I should have said was mill tail race. It's all a learning experience. So that's Pathhead Watermill everybody. It's worth coming to these places just to help preserve them because obviously they need the funds to keep going. Um, whether it's worth £3.50, I'm not sure, but it's worth £3.50 to help preserve such a place. So uh, if you're in the neighbourhood, definitely pop in. It'll only take well, about five minutes to have a look at everything. Um, and you're helping preserve a bit of history in doing so. In the 1930s, some boys were playing in this field and they happened upon two dead bodies. One of a man and one of a woman. They were found together in a cyst. With them was a flint knife and a beaker. The bodies were over 4,000 years old. This here is the summer house 
belonging to Stella Hall. It's what gives Summer Hill its name. It used to be called Summer House Hill, but then it got shortened to Summer Hill. Saved by Gateshead Council, otherwise it would have been demolished. Not much left of it now, just the outdoor walls. You get nice views though from here, I'll show you. Yeah, I'm saying nice. <laughs> Prominent views, probably the best words. It's not exactly nice views. I'll show you. Okay, Stella Hall was originally a 12th century manor house. At some point it became a nunnery. When Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, he took over the, the old manor house at Stella. And eventually, it ended up in the hands of Robert Anderson. He pulled it down and sold the land to the Tempest family. The Tempests then built Stella Hall. At some point, the structure behind me was built. Not exactly sure when. During the Battle of Newburn Ford in 1640, it was used as the base for the English army and Oliver Cromwell stayed there in 1651. In 1700, Lord Widrington, the fourth Baron of Widrington, uh, William Widrington, married Jane Tempest and Stella Hall passed into the Widrington family. Now it's William Widrington that is of interest and it's why he's part of this walk. He's the Jacobite that I was talking about. Widrington was a staunch Catholic and he was educated at uh, a Jesuit school in Saint Germain, Paris. And he was one of the key conspirators in the 1715 Jacobite uprising, although he was later to deny such a claim. Widrington was captured at the Battle of Preston with his two brothers, Charles and Peregrine. He was found guilty of treason and convicted to death, but that wasn't the end of his story. On his trial, on May the 7th, 1716, he pleaded not guilty to treason. However, after the evidence was put before him, he changed his plea to guilty on the 31st of May 1716. Now I'm not exactly sure what role Catherine Graham played in getting Widrington off the hook, but according to Wikipedia, that trusted source, uh, Catherine Graham was the person who got him off the charges of treason. However, I kind of think but it might have been the speech that he gave at his trial. It's certainly worthy of being let off. However, the speech that he gave at his trial was full of lies and deceit. My lords, I have abandoned all manner of defence ever since I first surrendered myself to His Majesty's royal clemency. If that was the case, why did he plead not guilty at first and then changed his plea afterwards? That's the first lie.
and only now beg leave to repeat to your lordships some circumstances of my unhappy case which I have already set forth in my answer. Your lordships see before you an unfortunate man who after leaving a private and retired life for many years has by one rash and inconsiderate action exposed himself and his family to the greatest calamities and misery and is now upon the point of receiving the severest sentence directed by any of our English laws. I do protest to your lordships, but I ne was never privy to any concerted measures against His Majesty's royal person or the established government. As to the insurrection in Northumberland, I only heard of it accidentally the night before it happened, and being soon after informed that all my neighbours and acquaintances had met in arms, a crowd of confused and mistaken notions hurried me at once into a precipitate resolution of joining them, a resolution which I must own I could never since calmly reflect upon without part of that confusion I find myself under in the public acknowledgement of so much rashness and folly. That was the second lie. Windrington was in charge of the second cavalry. After first plunging out of my death, as unprepared for such an enterprise as the action was unpremeditated, I cannot for my own particular upon strictest re recollection charge myself with any violation of the properties of my fellow subjects, but on the contrary, I always endeavoured to encourage humanity and moderation during the whole course of our miserable expedition. And in order to make the best atonement in my power for the great fault I had been guilty of, I can justly say that I was in no small degree instrumental in procuring a general submission to His Majesty. And the speech goes on and on and on and on about how he was the first person to surrender and how it was all not his fault and the usual excuses <laughs> for committing treason. The result, however, was that although he was led off for treason with his brothers, his lands were all confiscated and all his properties as well. And he ended up retiring in Bath there was a big confusion of when he died. Uh, some sources say 1743, others say 1745. But he died around about that time. And then the estate passed on to his son through the inheritance of his mother. Not the properties that Windrington owned before he got married, but just the ones that were previously owned by Jane Tempest. When his son died, there was no heir, and it went to a distant cousin. And at some point, it got bought by the Cowans. This was the original gatehouse to the hall. Now you might be wondering why I'm busy walking in an estate. Now let me show you. This estate is built on the site of Stella Hall. The last remaining Cowan died in 1948 of the Cowan family that owned the, es the estate. From what I can gather, the hall fell into disrepair. And in 1953, the hall was torn down and this estate was built in 1955. From what I can guess from comparing the maps, the hall would have been in this vicinity. But now it no longer exists, only 
the little bits I've shown so far, the summer house and the little bit that was crossing the stream earlier on. They're all that remain of Stella Hall, the home of Lord Widrington, one of the Jacobites who rebelled in 1715. And despite his protests, he was one of the key conspirators. You don't get to command the second cavalry of Northumberland and not to be one of the key conspirators. Bladen races. Official races started in 1861 on Bladen Island, which lay north of here. The song was written in 1862. From 1887 to 1914, the race course was on Stella Hoff, the site of the former power station. So, this is the site of where the Bladen Racers moved to. Where exactly? I'm not 100% sure. It could be on this side in this field, or it could be in this side, past these pylons, and there's a housing estate. So somewhere in this vicinity, any case. This here is Newburn Bridge. And it was here in 1640 that the Battle of Newburn Ford was fought. If you remember, I said that the English forces had stayed at Stella Hall. This was where the battle was fought. It was against Scottish Presbyterians who were uh, revolting against King Charles I about his introduction of the new prayer book. Happened on 28th of August 1640, and uh, there was about 3,500 English against 22,500 Scots. And the Scots had the higher ground to the north of the time. And they also had cannons as well. The fort could only be crossed at low tide, so there was only a small period of time when they could do it and the Scots were trying to come over to the south of the town in order to capture the coal fields and put pressure on King Charles. They tried twice to get across the town and both times they were forced back by the inferior English force. However, on the third time they managed to get across and the English fled and uh, the Scots controlled the coal fields of round Newcastle in order to try and put pressure on uh, the king. There was talk about possibly do, giving a ransom to the Scots, £200,000, which is a hell of a lot of money, but uh, Parliament refused to pass the bill that would have granted the Scots the £200,000 to buy them off. This eventually led to the English Civil War and Oliver Cromwell overthrowing King Charles I and King Charles lost his head. So that's why the Battle of Newburn Ford is an important part of history. Without the battle would the English Civil War have happened may also be the reason why, a few late years later, Oliver Cromwell stayed at Stella Hall. It says, hereabouts were buried 38 men and boys killed by the Stargate explosion, May the 30th, 1715. 
1826. Remote from where people live, men with lamps dig a shaft, a place where there is no foothold, and hang suspended far from mankind, they put a limit to the darkness, piercing the black and lightless rock, searching the depths of the earth, driving tunnels through the stone, men dig the hardest rocks to bring to daylight secrets that were hidden. Their eyes see all its treasure, but where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Job 28. This is the Holy Cross Church in Wrighton. It was built in 1220 and its spire dominates this part of the Tyne Valley. I see it for miles, as long as you're next to the river. Sadly, I can't take you inside the church because it's locked. So, perhaps another time. Behind me is what I've come to see, and it's the last item of my walk. This mound is a mot. And once there stood a mott and bailey here. Where the church is now would have been the bailey. Now the church was built in 1220 and motts and baileys didn't come into England until 1066. So we can assume that this is a 12th century mott. It would have given a commanding position at the time. I don't know if there was a fortification here at the time of the William Wallace, but William Wallace came to write it and burnt it to the ground. So another interesting historical thing about this place. Well, that ends my first walking with Jacobites walk. I hope you found it interesting. Um, I'll be doing some more of these kind of walks in the future. This is just the one that's closest to where I live, so it was easiest to do. So if you liked it, give me a like. Don't forget to comment below and subscribe. And uh, I'm not doing the weird deal way this weekend because Neil's got man flu. So what I'll do is I'll take my daughter out this weekend instead. So look out for that video and I'll see you on the next one.